Today's Grammar Girl episode is brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts. Upgrade your day with Dunkin' Donuts Perks, which offers on-the-go ordering so you can order ahead from your phone and speed past the line in the store. And with the Dunkin' app, you can even choose to pay from your phone. Plus, enjoy exclusive special offers like free beverages when you enroll and on your birthday. Give yourself an upgrade today by downloading the Dunkin' app and enrolling in DD Perks. Enter the code PODCAST and enjoy a free Dunkin' beverage. Speeding past the line may not be possible at all locations. Visit ddperks.com for terms and conditions. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip about the word capital and a meaty middle about citations. Let's start with the quick and dirty tip. If you're in the capital this weekend, you spell capital with an A and you don't capitalize the word. Capital with an A refers to a city that's the seat of government for its region or important in some way, but it has many other meanings too. A capital is an uppercase letter. Capital is wealth or money, especially in the context of business. For example, Squiggly needs capital to get his hot chocolate stand up and running. Capital can also mean particular or significant, as in, it is of capital importance that we arrive early so we don't end up in the back. And it can also mean fabulous, as in, bringing songs to sing on the bus? That's a capital idea! And of course, we have capital crimes and capital punishment, which relate to the death penalty. The other kind of capital, the noun that ends with an O-L, refers to buildings, state capitol buildings, or in the United States, the capitol building in Washington, D.C. Capital with an O is only for buildings. That's its only use. You capitalize it when you're writing about the capitol building in D.C., where the senators and representatives meet, and you leave it lowercase when you're writing about a state capitol building. Since capital with an O is just for buildings, you can remember the spelling by thinking of that big, round rotunda of the Capitol building, and it's round, just like the letter O is round in the word. Before we get to citations, it's time to thank our second sponsor. GlassesUSA.com is the leading online retailer for prescription glasses in the U.S. since 2009. They cut out the middleman, so prices can be up to 70% off retail. Plus, you can shop online from the comfort of your home without compromise on quality or service. GlassesUSA.com offers more than 2,500 styles of eyeglasses and sunglasses, including designer frames like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Tom Ford, and Armani. Their lenses and coatings are the same high quality as retail, and the glasses are professionally produced at state-of-the-art laboratories. They also make multifocal lenses and accommodate high prescriptions. Using GlassesUSA.com's virtual mirror, you can try on any pair of frames and see what they look like on your face by uploading your photo. At GlassesUSA.com, glasses start at only $48 with free prescription lenses. But for my listeners, GlassesUSA.com is offering 55% off your first pair of frames, including free basic prescription lenses, when you use the code GRAMMAR55 at checkout. Or go to glassesusa.com slash grammar. That's glassesusa.com slash grammar or the code grammar55 at checkout. Some exclusions do apply, so check out the site for full details. Over winter break, I saw a capital Beyonce meme that said, if you liked it, you should have put a citation on it, which made me laugh and reminded me of this listener question. Hi, Grammar Girl. My name is Laura, and I am a teacher of ninth grade English and a big fan of your podcast. I've used your podcast in my classroom, and the quick and dirty tips definitely come in handy. My question is, how do I cite your podcast and podcasts in general? Do you know of a website that keeps really up to date with how to cite things, especially citing things from the web? Thanks a lot. I'd love to hear you do a podcast about this one. Bye-bye. Thanks, Laura. All three of the major academic style players, the Modern Language Association, the American Psychological Association, and the Chicago Manual of Style, have issued guidelines on how to cite electronic sources. 
The Purdue Online Writing Lab, affectionately known as OWL, has a huge 12-page chart that compares all the different citation types for all three styles. It looks like it was last updated in 2014, so I checked all the current styles for citing websites and podcasts and made a small chart with examples that's on the transcript of this podcast at quickanddirtytips.com, since it's easier to look at it than to listen to me explain it. And it took me at least a couple of hours to look up all these styles and make sure I had them exactly right. And I'll caution you that at least some of the sites that claim to format your citations for you in all these styles don't do it perfectly. And when they disagreed, I used the style from either the style guide itself or from blog posts on the style guide's own websites. So you can go to the website to look at the examples and compare them. But I would like to talk about some other things related to citations. First, people have asked me why it's important to include citations in the first place. Aside from the fact that many teachers or editors require you to include citations in your work, including citations is necessary to acknowledge the people whose work you've incorporated into your document. Not including citations is a quick route to plagiarism, more commonly known as taking credit for someone else's work or ideas. Including citations is mandatory when you've drawn on someone else's original work or quoted someone verbatim. Second, even when citations aren't necessary to avoid plagiarism, including citations helps people who want to learn more about your topic. Citations are a great starting point for further research. And including citations adds credibility to your writing. Frankly, I include citations at the end of most of my transcripts to head off people who disagree with my recommendations relating to points of style or topics where there are common misconceptions. I'm completely open to disagreement and discussion, but I don't just make this stuff up. I research every topic I cover. And I'm almost always sorry when I don't include references on the website. And more than once, especially in the early years, I've gone back, reconstructed my work, and added citations later. Okay, so now that I've convinced you to include citations, it's time to think about the special risks of citing an electronic source, such as a website, podcast, or blog. First, you have to determine whether it's a credible source. And second, you have to worry about whether it'll still exist tomorrow. Determining whether a source is credible is subjective, but here are a few things to look for and consider. Can you tell who wrote the site? And if so, does the author seem to have any expertise in the area you're researching? The Stanford Cancer Center is likely to be a more credible source than Aunt Mary's cancer page. What are the credentials, or at least the stated credentials, of the author? I might take Aunt Mary more seriously if she's a board-certified oncologist practicing at a well-known hospital or university. Can you tell when the page you're looking at was written? All else being equal, something written recently is generally more credible than something that hasn't been updated in years. Does the page cite other credible sources you can check? There's that point about citations adding credibility again. Does it sound too good to be true? If it does, it probably is. Is the site selling something based on the information it's providing? If so, be wary. Do other credible sites link to the site? Many online tools let you see what sites link to other sites and pages. One free tool you can use is the Site Explorer at moz.com, M-O-Z.com. Are there a lot of typos? If there are a lot of language mistakes, it can mean that there are a lot of factual mistakes, too. Finally, use common sense and evaluate the arguments yourself. It's up to you to determine whether a site's conclusions are actually supported by its statements. You have control when you're evaluating a site's credibility, but you have less control over the fact that pages might disappear or change their web address. If it's an important source, you should consider printing out the page or saving it on your own computer as HTML, a screenshot, or an audio or video file. If you find that a web page is gone and you haven't had a chance to save it, you can search for a copy at the Internet Archive, also known as the Wayback Machine, at archive.org. 
Despite the risks, an abundance of credible information resides on the web, and you shouldn't dismiss a source simply because it's in an electronic format. The style guides let you cite live events you attend, which other people are much less likely to be able to revisit than a website or podcast. So cite away. Beyonce would want you to do it. Hello to Elena from Belarus, who listens with her family. And thank you to Jammy Rock 50 for the nice review at iTunes. And thank you to Robert, Rhonda, Vanessa, and Kim, who wrote nice book reviews. Last week, I had to carefully go through the grammar devotional for another project I'm doing, and it's been a while since I've looked at it because it was published in 2009, but I was really proud of it when I was going through it again. It's a great book. It may actually be my best book, and it's on sale for just $2.99 right now as an ebook, so you can even get it cheap. That's the grammar devotional for just $2.99. And I'm Mignon Fogarty. That's all. Thanks for listening.